Welcome to Battle for the Christian Mind, a dynamic and thought-provoking program dedicated to equipping you with the tools and insights necessary to develop a strong biblical worldview. Join us as we dive deep into the critical issues facing believers in today's rapidly changing world. This is Battle for the Christian Mind. It is good to be back and uh, welcome to Battle for the Mind. Now we're calling it Battle uh, for the Christian Mind. My name is uh, Kundan. I'm excited to be here. And uh, in the studio, I have Dr. Becker. How are you doing? Well, I'm excited about what's coming up for the next few weeks. It's good to get back in the saddle. It's been a long time since uh, we were last together in the, in the studio. And uh, it's going to be a good time, an exciting time. Indeed, I'm excited about it. And uh, Dr. Becker, you know, on this program, we're always saying the need for developing a biblical worldview. <laughs> um, I find I've been uh, emphasizing that for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> but it's 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 necessary. It's a it's a terminology we don't often use, but it's uh, it's a what it's about is about Christian discipleship, growing up and maturing as a Christian, just even as we're growing up and maturing. <sighs> In this life. <laughs> yeah. And and something interesting happened yesterday. Um, I was with uh, some believers and we're interacting and having conversations. And uh, I actually asked if they've heard of this concept of a biblical worldview. And I was told, no, oh, I've never heard about it. You know, so I did a little bit of explaining, but I also did encourage them that later on, go and do your own research and find out what is a biblical worldview and what that means to us who are believers. I'm not surprised, uh, even though the terminology has been in the Christian uh, circles for over 120, 130 years, uh, it's not a, a term that's often found you know, coming across the lips of many Christians. Uh, there have been numerous sermons written, I mean, they've pre preached about it, and there's been quite a few books. But as far as getting into mainstream Christian life, uh, most of us don't really think about biblical worldview, partially because it's not a term we find in the Bible. You can't go to the concordance and look up biblical worldview and find different references about it. So it's something you have to think about. But if we're really serious about Christian discipleship, we this is a term that we've borrowed from from the world to be able to help us understand more clearly the the foundations, the course values that we hold as people uh -huh. and as Christians. Yeah. And uh, the coming weeks uh, will have different topics, uh, obviously centered on developing a biblical worldview and obviously asking a lot of questions. And probably <laughs> some of those Those's questions, questions. Are, are going to help us to be honest with ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's my prayer. And uh, my prayer is that uh, people that are going to be listening uh, to this particular program, you know, they get the concept of biblical worldview and begin to see that there is that need for us to develop a biblical worldview. And there's something that you're always saying, Dr. Becker, you're always saying we never get to a place of full maturity and saying yeah. we can never develop our biblical worldview. But each and every time we have to continue developing a biblical worldview. It's a process of life. We'll be talking about this at different times, maybe a little bit today, I know for next week. But a, a worldview is formed in us from our birth. Uh, we develop a worldview through our entire lifetime. Although they say 60% of, of our value systems are in place by, by the ages six to eight, we're always developing our, our worldview. So uh, as Christians, we are doing the same because it's we're growing up. We have new diff new experiences in life in which if we're really honest and really want to take our faith into the avenues of life, we have to we have to explore n new understandings, new ways of thinking and uh, that affects our behavior, too, as Christians. So we're, we're, we're never perfected. <laughs> That's very true. And yes, it is a battle for the Christian mind. And uh, today, our first topic as we begin uh, this particular season or this particular time that God has allowed us uh, to talk about <laughs> biblical worldview, uh, we're going to be looking at why do we need a biblical worldview? Why do we need a biblical worldview? That's our topic today. And um, starting from there, Dr. Becker, I think I'd love to find out maybe we could just 
let me just try to define what is a worldview and what is a biblical worldview. Well, we're going to touch on that a little later, but right, you know, we we need we need to understand that that as people we think, as people we behave, yeah, and we we do these things based on the internal value systems that we develop from birth, and we need to know about the biblical worldview because there's a connection between maturing as a Christian and to what we have as the main lens of our experiencing the world around us. Uh, a, a worldview is just that. It's a lens. It's a lens of concept, a lens of ideas, a lens of values that help us to understand the environment that we live in. Uh, and, and that's the totality, whether it's nature, whether it's our so- social interactions, uh, whether it's ourselves. We need to understand, and the only way we can do that is through these these elements of a worldview that we gain and are taught from birth. And, you know, we, we just have to, we have to learn how to grow and mature oh. in our physical bodies, but also as a Christian, you know, and what, what we build upon is so important. I, if I could, I'd like to read from Matthew 7. Jesus understood the foundations are, are important for individuals. And he used a parable of the builders to talk about how important Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, his own teaching, his own, his own ministry, and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. When the rain descended and floods came, the winds blew and burst against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You know, to be a Christian, when we're called to be different. We're called out of this world into the kingdom, but yet we're not called just to die once we get saved. Once we were lost, now we're found. You know, our old self was crucified with Christ on the cross. And we're told to consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Though the word, the Bible doesn't use the term biblical worldview. It is filled with the understanding that that we as God, God's people have got to be different. Yeah. And, our, and our thinking has got to be different. Our behavior has to be different. And the only way to do that is to develop a new foundation within us which is called our biblical worldview. Indeed, and yes, we must be different uh, the way we think and uh, our set of beliefs. Because one thing that we do know is whatever we do, our actions are as a result of what we believe in. And so then if our actions are going to be different, then what we believe in must be different. And if we say we believe in God, we believe in the Word of God, we believe in the Bible, then surely our actions must be different. And I think that's why we bring in a lot of questions, Dr. Becker, because when we say we are believers and yet our actions are different from what we profess, then we begin to realize and think, okay, are we truly, truly, uh, you know, are we truly believers? Are we truly Christians? You know, and so it's very interesting. Earlier on, actually, I was actually even reading, you know, about a research and you know how I think it should be in America where they did a research on Christians and they, they found out that, you know, most people that say that they were Christians, their principles and everything else was totally away from the word of God. But yet they well, say they have shown less than 4% of the Christian community in the evangelical Christian community have a biblical worldview. Uh. How could that be? Because if we talk about a biblical worldview, you're talking about your belief systems. You're talking about, about what are the foundations to, to what you believe and how you act and how you think. And only 4%? You know, I, I think there's one point we, we ought to make right now. I, I, I'd like to draw a distinction between a biblical worldview and a Christian worldview. Yeah. I've chosen to to speak of a, of a biblical worldview, because if we use, say Christian worldview, it often, it often incorporates a, a aspects of our, of our denominational joining or, or of our religious beliefs. Uh, the biblical worldview sees the world and how we live in it through the lens of, of God's Word. 
uh, un, unadulterated. It's just we take the Bible and and and, uh, and allow God to to reveal His character to us, to reveal His plan to us, to reveal how He interacts with His creation to us. The Bible should be the va- va- very basis to to all our beliefs. And unfortunately, it's not always on every level for many Christians. We must understand that not everything that defines our Christian perspectives and practices is based on the Bible. You realize that? Yeah. We might call ourselves Christians, yeah. but not everything we believe, not everything we do <laughs> is, is always found in the Bible. That doesn't mean that since there's no real biblical foundation for some of our beliefs and practices, that doesn't mean they're necessarily wrong. It's just that they do not define the best foundation on which we should build our lives and to be true followers of Jesus. So I'd really like to, you know, we we, we, we tend to read our Bibles from our from our tradition. Yeah. We approach the Bible based on, on our understanding from our society, from from our understanding from our churches. And in other words, we you know, too often we use the Bible to justify our beliefs rather than allowing the Bible to justify how we live, or to, to challenge how we live. The Bible has got to be the only source to inform what we believe and, and how we would live. Our worldview governs. Folks, you got you to understand, the, our worldviews govern how we live, how we think, how we behave, how, everything about our lives. Thus, what the actual worldview we develop is, is extremely important to our lives. And that's why we, we want to talk about it for these few weeks. Yeah, and and, and Dr. Becker, just a little bit there. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> there are things we believe and <laughs> do as Christians, and yet they're not fully founded on the Word of God, which is the Bible. You, you mean, uh, are there some things that we do in church that may not exactly be biblically based? Yeah. There are, you know, I've, I've got, I've got a book. I've got to, I've got to show you this. If you ever get a chance to get this pagan, pagan Christianity, yeah. Yeah, and these two authors, Frank Viola and George Barna, they come up with a list of about, about, uh, well, they had several lists, about nine, eight, nine different items that, that were found in the Christian life that are not always biblically based. What, what is, what, what kind of building do we call the church? In the early church, they met in homes. There were no real church buildings for the first one, two hundred years of the church. Uh, and then today, what is it we define as a church? Does it have to be a grand edifice based on the, the kind of churches we see built during the, the uh, Middle Ages with the grand monasteries? I mean, not monasteries, but the, the big cathedrals we find in Europe. And Do they have to have stained glass? Do they have to have a single pulpit in the middle or split pulpits? Well, what is this building we call the church? The Bible really doesn't define. And yet we sanctify a certain construction as being the church with a steeple and stuff. You know, it's, well, what, what, what's the Bible have to say about the kind of building we live or in? The second thing they point out is the order of how we conduct the worship service. Is there a liturgy that we have to follow? In most charismatic churches around the world today, we've got singing, prayer time, and preaching. Yeah. And the singing is usually divided between praise and worship. And then there's prayer time that can either be from the leadership or as groups among the people. And then sermons can go from 20 minutes to an hour, hour and a half. Uh-huh. And then we're finished and we go home. Uh, what is a liturgy? A lot of people moved to that during the early charismatic movement back in the late 60s and early 70s because the old denominational liturgies were kind of boring, they thought. So let's do something more alive. Yet, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible say, well, what? It says if you've got a song, bring it. If you've got a word, bring it. What kind of what kind of churches were held in those early days? Third, what is the sermon? You know, do we need a three points in a prayer kind of sermon? Do we need half of our worship service devoted to the sermon? You know, I'm probably going to step on some toes on this one, but, you know, is a sermon so important 
Is it biblically mandated? Well, you know, it says, yes, Paul was preaching. But how often did he preach? When did he preach? Was it only on Sunday mornings or sometimes in the marketplace, sometimes in people's homes? How often was it set up? Any of the apostles, when did they preach? Was it just for the worship service we find in the church, or was there a difference? So what does the Scripture say about our sermons? The pastor. <laughs> what kind of clothing should a pastor wear? Do we wear the robe? Suits? I remember one missionary in Kenya, he traveled with a, a briefcase full of ties because he wouldn't allow any man to get up and preach without a tie. Hmm. Can you preach without a tie? What about if you can you preach with blue jeans on? Like my jeans, the one I'm wearing right now. <laughs> what, what about shorts? <laughs> you know, what is the uniform for a pastor to preach in? Hyper doesn't say. <laughs> Jesus, in fact, made point of beware of the teachers of the law, he says. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. This we find read in Luke 20, 46. So it, for Jesus, it wasn't important what clothing you wore. Fifth, ministers of music. Today, we've actually, and this is going to trouble some people, I'm sure, but what is the biblical foundation for our music ministry? I think if we really look at it, sometimes our music ministry ends up being more entertainment than it is a, a flow from the from the souls of the people in the church to worship God through music. Again, in the Scripture, it says if someone has a song, bring it. It might not be in order. It might we not might not have this beautiful sounding thing. But you know, we can have a church without keyboards and drums. You don't have to have a guitar to in order to have a worship service and worship teams. Where did that come from? You know, worship teams didn't even work in existence until the early 70s with the Vineyard Movement oh. and the, chap- and the, and the, and the, and the what is it? Calvary Chapel. Tithing and clergy salaries. How do we support the church? Is tithing and biblically mandated for the New Testament church? The sacraments, how do we handle them? What do we do with, with the Lord's Supper? In the, in the Scripture, it does say that the Lord's Supper was served in, in, as a meal when all the members of the church gathered together and, and ate together. But do we do that today? Christian education, what does it become? If we, you know, Sunday school, you know, Sunday school started at the churches in England in the late 1700s, not to teach about the church or Christianity, but to help provide an education to the children who had to work the other six days of the week. Okay. Give them an education because they couldn't go to school. Then later, it became part of, of a time to teach children and as part of an evangelistic outreach. Do we need Bible schools? Do we need seminaries? Do they really equip men and women to be ministers of the gospel? And how do we approach the Bible? <laughs> or rarely do we approach the Bible as a whole. Most of the time, we go to the Bible looking at those chapters and verses which were put in later and and. We chop it up to make proof text instead of reading Paul's writings as a letter to read the, the history of the church without the breaking of, of, of verses and stuff into it. These are things that, that are not always biblical mandated. Another author, Peter, uh, Peter Dahan, he listed six traditions, you know, to go to church on Sunday. Where does it say? It says we meet together, but it, is it always mandated to meet on Sunday? How to, how to, the necessity of, Folding your hands and close your eyes and bow your head when you pray. Biblically mandated method for praying. Tithing to the local church. The prayer of salvation. You know when the prayer of salvation got started? Moody in some of his uh, uh, crusades back in the 1800s. First time they ever did a prayer of salvation. The Sunday church format. Again, we're talking about liturgy and the Lord's Supper. You know, these are just some of the beliefs to the and practices found in the church today that do not have a biblical mandate for the following. This is very, very interesting. And and obviously, I love how you had to put it when you were beginning to talk about some of these things and some of the beliefs. And obviously, did say, we do practice some of them in the church that might not be found in the Bible exactly, but also doesn't mean they are bad also. No, it doesn't you know, mean Yeah, but they might not be like, they they. But you know, but it's but is it's, it something we write our life on? Yeah, is it something that 
forms that rock upon which we live and where we can't change from? Are the truths so fundamental that we, we build how we live and believe upon those? Oh, yeah. And uh, in case you've just tuned in, uh, this is a battle for the Christian mind right here on Radio Christian Voice. Uh, do make sure that you also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Radio Christian Voice, because Battle for the Mind will be there as well. So you can simply just share it, stream it, and leave some comments, leave some questions as well. would love to know uh, how you're finding the program today. And we're simply looking at why do we need a biblical worldview. Why do we need a biblical worldview? It's, it's, it's a very, very uh, interesting question. And so, Dr. Becker, uh, I'm sure many are listening, you know, and they're surprised to hear uh, some of these things that you're sharing today. I'm sure some may be up in arms about a few of these aspects Maybe. and what we know as the modern Christian church and the life that you are saying may not be biblical. They're saying this man, what is he saying now? <laughs> I, and again, I just want to reemphasize that, that a lot of things we do in our Christian life are, are, not, are not bad but they may not be biblically mandated. And if we're going to develop a biblical worldview, we want as the very core elements of our, of our lens that we understand God's creation and, our, and the life around us to be rooted in the Word of God, not just in the tradition practices that we have. Uh, you know, I've got another book in my library. I brought it along just because I wanted to show you. Sacred Cows Make Gourmet Burgers. Sacred cows are those things that, that are untouchable, unassailable. Criticizing them uh, is sure to bring on the wrath of the tradition's maintainers. You know, the Hindus venerate cows, you know, uh, raising them even to be more important than people. People can be starving on the streets, uh, but and cows all around them, food available, but they, won't, they can't be used because they're sacred. No one can kill a cow because it's too important. Could we, we, we develop traditions in the church that become sacred cows, mm. that become so important, so unassailable, that uh, they cannot be criticized, cannot be Christian. You know, even the concept of tithing. In the United States, tithing was never, ever mentioned in the church. Never. Preached about, talked about nothing. From, it, from the existence of the United States, even in early colonial days, until 1873, when two Presbyterian pastors who were concerned about the falling income among the denominations' churches decided to write about how important the tithe was for the people to give tithe to support the church. Before that, there was no talk about it. But now it is so rooted in tradition to even raise a question about it causes fireworks to go off in a lot of circles. Uh, to, to question music teams, worship teams, it's so entrenched in some circles that you know, that, that can never even be discussed. If you know, if God's not afraid of my questions, why should the church be afraid? Mm. You know, I I really believe that I can go to God and ask Him. You know, is this really important? Is this what's this mean? What's it about? And He He's willing and open to let me find out. But the church sometimes isn't. You know, could what I folks what I want in my life. My life as a follower of Jesus is to be able to do what is said in Ephesians 4, I think it's verse 13, 14, where I can attain the full stature of Christ in my life. That's what I want. And this requires that I be a man of the Word of God. Each of us are commanded to become Christ-like, and so we've got to make the Word of God the core of our understanding of the universe. Uh, <laughs> Moses received Ten Commandments on, on, on tablets of stone. The Jewish leaders over the next generations filled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of explanation for those ten simple simple laws of how to live them. Sometimes uh, we in our traditions today try to expand upon what God says, and we end up losing the Word of God. And uh, in case you've just tuned in, this is a battle for the Christian mind. And uh, we are simply saying this program today that a biblical worldview is necessary for Christians to live in a relationship with God. 
and his creation. When a person becomes a new believer um, in Jesus, they become a new creation, an actual new person. Sin is no longer the master of their lives, so they must begin to live differently. And this is where the importance of developing a biblical worldview comes into play. It really does. It really does. It's important that that we as Christians, as we try to mature as Christians, don't don't try to walk the life double-minded. Try to walk as uh, with one foot in the world and one foot in the Bible. God wants us. We need a foundation in His Word. We need the biblical worldview. We need a lens and a value system based only on the Word of God. We must, as Christians, understand that Christianity is a way of life that is fully embracing of all life. This is one thing I think, Kunda, that we'll be touching on in the weeks to come. Christians really doubt that their faith encompasses all of life. It's good for Sunday morning and the religious aspect of our life. But when it comes to going to work, raising our children, all all the other aspects of life, Christianity is inadequate because we've let the world tell us that. So we want to touch on that for the next few weeks that... Christianity is valid for your whole life. And, and you know, with that, Dr. Berka, we are always segmenting our lives. It's like there's always this part, which is like, you know what? On Sunday, I'm a believer. Or on this day, I'm a believer, right? Or uh, this is not church. Or I can't do this because this is not church. Not just implying the beliefs or the things that are done in church, but implying that I'll not apply any Christian principles, I'll not apply any biblical principles here because I feel we cannot apply those biblical principles here, which is very, very interesting. And the world's tried to tell us, keep separate the sacred and the secular. Keep your religion for your for your corner and for that aspect of your life. But when it comes to living, you've got to come into our world and follow our rules. Mm. But, you know, as we come to a close, you know, we need to remember, and we're going to bring this scripture up quite often. A biblical worldview gives us a grounding to make scripture real. And it says, whatever you do in word and deed, do all, no exception, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father, Colossians 3, 17. Hmm. All of our life must be governed by a biblical worldview because we live all of our life as a Christian. Everything. <laughs> you know what we would say in our local language in Bamba? You've been here for a long time, so you understand some of these things. But we would say, Fionse. Fionse. <laughs> Everything. No exceptions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Baker, for coming through it's today. Been good. It's been awesome. It's been good. Yeah. Looking forward Thank to you. next week. Looks good. Great. All right, it's been Battle for the Christian Mind right here on Radio Christian Voice. Thank you very much for tuning in, and thank you so much for keeping it Radio Christian Voice. Do make sure that you subscribe uh, to our Radio Christian Voice YouTube channel, and you can also always text us on 0956 400 That is on WhatsApp or a text message. Always come through, and uh, let's get interactive Leave those questions, leave those comments, and together let's develop let's develop a biblical worldview. Right. Bye bye for now. Thank you for joining us on Battle for the Christian Mind. We hope today's discussion has challenged you to critically evaluate your beliefs and align them with the teachings of the Bible. Tune in next week as we continue to explore the intersection of faith and society. Until then, stay strong in your convictions and keep fighting the battle for the Christian mind.